All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Uh, welcome to a Rafael Medina case discussion. Uh, today's focus is dermatology. I'm super excited to learn dermatology today and learn from our fantastic case discussant today, Dr. Eamon Mayer. So Dr. Eamon Mayer, he is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, and he has a special interest in complex medical dermatology, particularly cutaneous lymphomas and connective tissue diseases. So Eamon, thank you so much for joining us today and for teaching us dermatology. Um, and I'm wondering if you could kind of unmute and share a little bit about how you developed an interest in dermatology and specifically kind of those focus areas. Uh, yeah, of course. Of course, I would love to. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. I've been a fan of this uh, podcast for a long time, and I still watch it from time to time on my drive to work. Um, so uh, how did I get interested in dermatology? I, I probably wouldn't have chosen it, had, uh, but my older brother is a dermatologist. So sort of through him, I was able to see that it can be more things than just acne and Botox, which I think is sort of um, the impression that a lot of people have. Um, and the way that I ultimately, um, the thing that sort of cemented that you dermatology could be really cool is I was on an away rotation and um, a resident was uh, presenting to the attending outside the room and she was kind of like distractedly typing notes while listening to the presentation. And the, the physical finding was bullous arthropod bites. So people that develop blisters to bug bites and the resident gave a differential and she was like, yeah, what about lymphoma? Um, and he was like, I guess. I, I mean, like, I didn't think of that. So we went in there and um, from across the room, she spotted that this lady had lymphadenopathy and she had me go feel her neck and the lady had giant lymphadenopathy and she was ultimately diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma. And in uh, Bologna, the dermatology book, there's a there's a, a table that lists the things associated with bullous arthropod bites and it's mantle cell lymphoma, NKT cell lymphoma and CLL. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. That is so cool. Wow, my gosh. Uh, and before we jump into the case, kind of a, a non-medical question, what is something like in the last week that that brought you joy? Um, as I was talking to you about before I started this, I really like to, I, I grew up playing soccer and my brother lives in town. So we go play pickup once or twice a week. So um, we were just doing that and we played a game of, of cribbage, which is a fun card game, so. That's awesome. Well, we will um, jump into the case. So uh, Jimena will be presenting the case. Jimena, do you want to unmute, introduce yourself, and maybe also share something that, that brought you joy in the last week? <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, for everyone, my name is Jimena. I am a medical student. I am from Guatemala, and uh, I spend most of my time there. But right now I'm in Boston doing a clinical rotation. And um, something that brought me joy was because I'm living in Boston right now, I'm staying with my aunt and she has a cat and it's like the cutest cat. <laughs> so uh, it's just nice to come home every time uh, or every afternoon and just like spend some time with a cat because he already loves me <laughs> and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> so, yeah. I love that. All right, well, we can jump into the case. So um, Mario, thank you so much for scribing and Jimena, whenever you're ready, you can share the first alquat. Thank you. And uh, before we start, I want to say that this case was authored by Dr. Alec Retzig. I am just um, doing the favor of presenting the case, and I hope that you guys like it. So we have a 75-year-old female with a diffuse rash on her arms, buttocks, legs, abdomen, chest, and back that appeared two weeks ago. Okay. So do you want me to, do I jump in here and say a little bit about this? Yes, that would be a great place. And if you could talk about kind of any particular framework you use to think about a rash or how do you think about rashes in general? Yeah, so usually I think this scenario is a little bit different than uh, usually uh, because, uh, you know, dermatology is a very visual specialty. So you, the things that I'll talk about, you sort of get immediately upon looking at them. Um, and uh, and you don't necessarily think about those um, ahead of time, but if uh, a good framework that I've heard used before is like sick or not sick um, when it comes to having a diffuse rash. So um, uh, if someone, um, is, there are certain rashes that are can be diffuse and people appear sick uh, immediately um, uh, when looking at them, things like uh, severe dress, 
or drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, SJS, um, if you have a bullous disorders uh, with large surface areas, cutaneous lymphomas, in uh, depending on which kind you have, um, they can be diffuse and people can appear very uh, sick as well. Um, so uh, with this kind of history, this age group, um, I would sort of be uh, thinking about, um, and, and this distribution, um, some initial thoughts would be like lymphomas, Bullous disorders tend to be more common in older age groups um, and uh, drug reactions are some of the most common things that we see. Um, and you also wanna connect that to the time course um, as well. Uh, that's uh, often much more powerful when you're thinking about problems related to internal medicine and illnesses, but it can still be useful um, when it comes to dermatology um, and one example being like when you think about certain cutaneous lymphomas like mycosis fungoides um, versus uh, other ones like Cesare syndrome or, you know, something like NKT cell lymphoma, one has a long indolent history and another one has sort of a more um, abrupt onset. And one question I had is, so um, the, so Jimena described this rash as diffuse and I'm curious in your mind, if a rash is diffuse versus if it's more localized, like how does that help you think about a differential for a rash? Um, that is a good question. Um, and it's tough to give an answer to it that is applicable in all scenarios um, because there's a spectrum of severity for each uh, type of rash. So like, um, for instance, psoriasis is one that's often localized, right? We think about it as being on the <clears throat> extensor surfaces, the scalp, um, et cetera. But then there are also cases where psoriasis can cover 90% of the body surface area. Um, I think that the more diffuse a rash is, um, I, I think it's... Um, fair to characterize that as being more severe and there's probably more inflammation going on and more likely to be associated um, disturbances either in how the patient is feeling, labs, et cetera, or may require more powerful immunosuppression, et cetera. Amazing, thank you. Um, Jimena, back to you. So, um, the story with this patient is, is that the rush appeared two weeks ago. It was not itchy nor painful. Uh, she tried a few body lotions and changing her laundry detergent, but she reported that the rash kept getting worse. Uh, she also reports right arm pain. Um, she suffered a mechanical fall two weeks prior, and she thought that the pain would improve, um, but she still feels the same. As she denies weakness, numbness, or tingling, and um, she also reports anorexia due to stress, but denied dysphagia, odinophagia, abdominal pain, nausea, or vomiting. Okay. Um, so uh, now a, a lot of this history is sort of hinting at possible other intersections between skin-limited problems and um, systemic problems. Um, itchy, not itchy or painful isn't <clears throat> super helpful um, in day-to-day -day practice. There are some things that are classically itchy, um, but that like for instance, um, numular eczema, um, but the absence of itch uh, uh, with this classically itchy entity doesn't mean that it can't be that. Um, also like when it comes to nerves, itch and pain, some can sometimes be interchangeable, like when you're dealing with chronic itch patients. So um, it doesn't weigh super heavily on the scales of what the diag diagnosis might be. Um, people, the first thing that people tend to ask about is detergents with clothes. Um, and, you know, we deal with eczema a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, especially allergic contact eczema. Detergents tend to not be as common of a cause as people think. Um, if you think about it, you're putting in this small amount of um, thing that you might be allergic to and then diluting it in gallons and gallons of water. Um, and then it might be, some of it might have dried onto a fabric that may or may not um, be in contact with your skin for a long time. So 
um, in, in practical sense, that ends up not being as important. Um, the, the pain in the arm, uh, the way that it's written kind of sounds like it's not associated, um, except for it's possible that maybe the pain is related to the rash and the patient's misattributing it uh, to the fall. Um, sometimes that happens. Um, uh, and then you may have the question of why is this patient falling? Um, do they have some sort of associated uh, sensory neuropathy impairing proprioception and they're tripping? Um, and then uh, reported anorexia. Um, I think that that's probably deciding whether that's important or not um, is influenced by how much weight has actually been lost. Um, if someone says that they're, you know, or they report anorexia subjectively, but they're the same weight, that's probably not as clinically significant as someone who reports anorexia and is demonstrably 10 pounds lighter than they were. Um, no weakness, numbness, or tingling um, helps sort of uh, weigh against there being a neuropathy um, that would mean that the corticospinal tract and the dorsal columns um, uh, tend seem to be working okay. Um, no dysphagia or adynophagia, um, uh, not super relevant uh, yet. Um, but maybe suggest that there's not, if, you know, they were having anorexia to uh, secondary to a malignancy, it doesn't seem to be affecting the upper GI um, system yet. Amazing discussion. Uh, one question I had is, you know, kind of backing up. So like when someone presents with a rash, you know, Jimena talked about that the patient tried different lotions, laundry detergents. What other questions do you find are like very helpful when someone presents with a rash and you're trying to understand the different etiologies? Are there certain kind of questions you want to make sure that you always ask a patient? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I and it, I, a dermatologist, I think that having transitioned from intern year to dermatology, we come at it a little bit differently where a lot of the time I look at the rash and I know that things that look like that have this histology and then I can come up with a differential from that appearance and then ask the relevant question. So if it looks spongiotic, uh, I have a list of things, spongiotic is a histological term. I have a list of things that are spongiotic, including allergic contact dermatitis. And then I'll be like, oh, like based on the distribution, if it's around the axillary folds here, that's associated with allergy to clothing dyes. I can ask them if they've been wearing any darkly colored clothing. Um, as far as uh, um, new onset, um, in this scenario with the information that I have here, um, I think that, um, you know, diffuse is sort of um, a, too vague to make, uh, to ask questions about like with respect to uh, contact allergens. Um, oftentimes when we see a diffuse rash, it may be related to something like a drug reaction, um, something intrinsic to the skin like um, psoriasis or atopic dermatitis, um, occasionally uh, like bolus disorders, connective tissue disorders. Um, I think asking, have you started any new medications is a, uh, a good question to ask. Um, and then um, depending on what the rash looks like, um, uh, asking targeted review of systems questions. Perfect. All right, Jimena, back to you. Great. So with the past medical history, she has GERD, hypertension, diabetes, and her last A1C was 5.9, hyperlipidemia, and uh, HFPA. And family history, she has two brothers that had cancer, but she doesn't know which type of cancer it was. Uh, she denies being a smoker, a drinker, or the use of uh, drugs. She is a um, retired. And I think that we can just jump right into the physical exam, if that's okay with you guys. Um, she was a febrile. Her blood pressure was 108 over 62, heart rate 104. Uh, the respiration 16 and the saturation 96. 
the patient uh, appears in no acute distress. We couldn't palpate any lymphadenopathy, no oral pharyngeal exudate, ulcerations, or erythema. In cardiovascular, she had tachycardia, but regular rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Pulmonary, uh, she had um, no wheezes or bronchi. The abdomen was soft, non-tender, non-distended. And um, in musculoskeletal, there was mild tenderness to palpation over the right arm, though normal range of movement and no significant swelling or erythema. And for the skin, I have a picture for you guys. So if it's okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And here it is. The rush for you. I think it would be great uh, if you could describe it for uh, us students that don't know a lot about dermatology. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my screen is a little bit blurry, but basically what it looks like is there's a, a collection of uh, papules. Um, you could say coalescing into plaques. You could say sort of agmenated is a fancy word that you could use if you wanted to show off. Um, uh, important things to note are the color. Um, it has sort of like this deep uh, pink, red. Some of the spots almost have like a plum-like color. Um, and um, it's a little bit uh, uh, pixelated for me, but there doesn't appear to be a lot of like scaling or surface change to the rash. Um, and that's important because that helps you, uh, if that is the case, and I hope I'm not heading down the wrong path, that helps you move away from um, spongiotic or eczematous rashes. It helps you move away from psoriasiform rashes. Um, and you can start to think about more dermally based rashes like um, uh, um, uh, granulomatous things like sarcoid, um, lymphocytic things uh, like lymphomas, um, or uh, uh, vascular entities, uh, like vasculitis, stuff like that. Um, so to, to sort of back up and resummarize, I think that you could say that there are uh, um, tightly clustered, at least in this picture, although that we did say that the uh, rash is diffuse, tightly clustered um, uh, papules coalescing into plaques um, and sort of an agmenated morphology. Amazing. I learned a new word. I did not know. What was that? Agmenate, ag, agmenated? Agmenated, yeah. Agmenated. Wow. <laughs> um, one question I had. So you talked about the differential for dermally based rashes. So the granular. Yeah. How would you um, make progress on those three? I'm sorry, you said granulomatous what? Just those, the differential you gave for the oh. dermally based rashes. Like what would be the next step to distinguish between those? Yeah, so that's a uh, a good question. Um, and uh, I think um, there are some clues that you can use um, uh, to make your best guess. But at that, looking at the rash, there's not necessarily more information that you um, can get. It's not like when you're suspecting something, you can then ask like a clarifying question. So granulomatous, uh, classically like a, a, a pap, uh, collections of papules that without surface change typically calls to mind things like um, uh, granuloma annulare um, and sarcoid. Sarcoid and other granulomatous rashes tend to have like classically an apple jelly uh, color, which is kind of like a brownish uh, yellow. And if you look up pictures of uh, dermoscopy of sarcoid and then look up pictures of apple jelly, you'll see that the description is apt. Um, so one would be uh, the color. Um, and then you with uh, uh, um, and then like lymphomatous things, they tend to have a um, uh, a deeper red or purple uh, color. Um, for the most part, um, that uh, the other thing that you can do is like push on them. So if they feel firm, um, then that usually means that there's infiltration of the dermis um, versus say a vasculitis, although it's like palpable, it doesn't feel indurated the, the same way that like a lymphomatous nodule 
or uh, like a plaque of sarcoid mite. Um, yeah. And so about uh, uh, um, talking about the, the physical exam, um, so just looking at that, obviously you don't want to like narrow too much, um, but that color uh, had sort of a uh, lymphomatous appearance to it. Um, um, that would be something that would be floating around towards the top of my differential. Going back to like the sick or not sick dichotomy, um, you know, she's older, um, she's afebrile, um, she does uh, have tachycardia and she has a little bit of like maybe the beginnings of slightly widened pulse pressure. Um, uh, poss you know, maybe there's some sort of uh, uh, um, systemic vasodilatory process going on. Um, so I and uh, I'm starting to be more concerned about her. Amazing. And then last question before I pass the mic to Jimena. So you talked about a lot of the things on the differential, but one of them being kind of a cutaneous lymphoma. Could you talk a little bit about like from the appearance, can you tell if it's B cell or T cell or is there not enough information by just what it looks like to make progress on that? General, it would be really nice if you could generally know. Um, the majority of cutaneous lymphomas are T cell lymphomas. Those make up about like 70, 75%. So um, using base rate, it's typically going to be a T cell lymphoma. Um, and then of the T cell lymphomas, far and away, the most common one is mycosis fungoides, which presents with sort of on a, a, a typical case, which obviously there's variation, presents with like a slowly accumulating um, uh, patches that may progress to plaques, typically occurring in double covered areas like the chest, the breast, the buttock, um, the thighs, things like that. Um, and then the B cell lymphomas far and away, the most common ones are uh, uh, follicular lymphoma, which I think of follicles as being central and they tend to occur centrally on the head and neck. Marginal zone lymphomas, which uh, uh, and follicular lymphoma presents as like little papules or plaques, kind of like we saw there. Uh, marginal zone lymphoma tends to be um, a little bit more marginal, occurring on the trunk and extremities, um, usually the upper extremities, and also typically classically presents as like collections of small papules. And then diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which um, is more aggressive than the other ones and will typically. Uh, um, in classical cases present with large uh, uh, nodules or tumors on the lower extremities. Amazing. Thank you for that walkthrough. Uh, all right, back to you, Jimena. Well, thanks for that description. I know that the picture was a little bit blurry, but the lesion was described as um, located in the medial inner upper arms, the abdomen, the lower legs, uh, with multiple red violaceous firm nodule plaques, uh, with some central splearing and some forming an annular appearance. So um, if you don't wanna say anything, oh, comment yeah. on this. So um, I, I was just thinking because that's sort of like uh, um, the, uh, annular clear, so um, uh, dermal papules without surface change um, uh, in an annular configuration with a little bit of central clearing is sounds like a good description for um, granuloma annulare, which is a benign skin limited condition. Um, those typically aren't described as violaceous and the people who have it typically aren't sick. Um, so I was mentally weighing this like annular um, with central clearing, um, which is related, I think it uh, makes me think of a benign condition, um, and then having that weighed against um, the mindset that I was in, which was maybe this person's a little bit more sick. Thank you for showing us that. I think that that's a great way to see this, um, especially when there's a lot of factors that are playing into this. And um, moving into the labs, the sodium was uh, 137, the potassium was 3.6, the chlor chloride 98, uh, the BUN 20, the creatinine 0.86, glucose 139, calcium 
magnesium 1.5, phosphorum 3.6. She had a white blood cell count of 5.8K with normal differential, a hemoglobin of 12.5 um, with an MCV of 96, flat levels in 249K. Uh, she also got a troponin of uh, 0 0.01 and a BNP of 246. She also got a urinalysis uh, with proteins in 30, negative nitrates, um, white blood cells, uh, 31 to 75, uh, red blood cells from four to 10, some yelling casts. And she also had a lactate of 9.6. She got an ECG that revealed sinus tachycardia with low voltage and a, a left anterior fascicular block. She also had a chest x-ray that revealed no acute process and an x-ray for the arm that revealed no evidence of a fracture. Okay. Um, so this is all uh, helpful. So um, the I think the thing that uh, uh, there are a couple abnormalities. Um, yeah, 5,800. Okay. Um, the thing that stands out as most abnormal to me is the lactate of 9.6, um, which my, uh, I, I think that there's a more nuanced uh, understanding of lactate production. Um, I don't deal with this a lot, but I, I can sort of think of it as like, there's not enough um, oxygen getting to the inside of the cell, um, uh, whether that's from like true ischemia or because of uh, some sort of um, distributive, pro I mentioned previously, like some sort of um, vasodilatory process with the increased heart rate and the pulse pressure, um, the lactate um, ki uh, kind of fits with that. Um, then there were, uh, there appears to be some pyuria, um, uh, some proteinuria, um, also with some RBCs. Um, the protein's not super high, like you might, although your spot urine's not super accurate, it's not immediately consistent with like some sort of nephrotic syndrome. Um, the other thing that uh, stands out is the low voltage. Um, which, uh, um, there are probably other causes, but uh, as a dermatologist, the only one that I associate, um, uh, low voltage with, especially in the context of having, um, an enlarged heart would be amyloid. Um, amyloid can also cause cardiomyopathy. Um, there, uh, there's a couple different hereditary kinds, um, and some acquired kinds. She does have a history of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and then um, this, although she didn't have any positive view of systems for neuropathy, amyloid can also cause neuropathy. Um, uh, you can have uh, uh, skin manifestations of amyloid, the most classic one being macroglossia, where they'll show you pictures of like a scalloped tongue, um, where a large tongue has made impressions, uh, or your teeth have made impressions on the inside of the tongue. You can have um, the shoulder pad sign. Um, uh, they have like depositions in their um, uh, shoulder pads. Um, and then you can get like primary uh, AL amyloid, which presents with kind of these like reddish sort of um, uh, moist looking plaques, um, which I, the picture could be consistent with that. Um, so, uh, this appears to be, uh, you know, there, it's a diffuse rash, um, which is probably more likely to be, um, related to something systemic. Um, she, her, uh, circulatory system appears like it might be involved with this tachycardia pulse pressure, um, and, and elevated lactate lactate. Um, and then her heart appears to be involved, um, with, uh, the possibly with the low voltage and, uh, left anterior fascicular block. And then her kidneys appear to be involved, um, um, uh, with, uh, um, the elevated white blood cells and she doesn't have nitrates. So there's not like less likely to be grim, less likely to be uh, um, a urinary tract infection.
Amazing discussion. I know we gave you a lot of labs for, for a dermatology VMR. <laughs> um, uh, I'm curious, so kind of with this diffuse rash and the information we've gotten so far, kind of what would you want to do next to try to investigate what's going on? Um, obviously biopsy it so I can look at the histology, but that's sort of cutting to the end. Um, uh, if I was a, if I was a dermatologist, if putting, putting on my, um, internal medicine hat, um, I think that a good thing to, um, uh, tug on is the, um, kidneys. Um, quantifying the um, amount of protein in the urine um, can be helpful, like nephrotic versus nephritic syndrome is a useful dichotomy. Amyloid, um, there's probably more than one um, manifestation, but is classically a nephrotic syndrome. Um, the... Um, uh, and then depending on the histology of the biopsy, um, you could do um, a cardiac MRI to look for that sort of like speckling that you see. Um, and um, I think that more immediately with the lactate, um, uh, she probably needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be given some fluids. If, I don't know if that would mess with her cardiac physiology. All right, amazing. Back to you, Jimena. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna give you some labs like in different order. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's how they were done to the patient because you were kind of right that we're gonna leave the biopsy to the end. <laughs> but um, they made her a TTE that revealed left and right ventricles with normal size and normal wall thickness. Her LVEF was from 60 to 65. There was a prominent lymphomatose hypertrophy of the interatrial septum that extends to the posterior right atrial wall and a moderate pericardial effusion without evidence of cardiac tamponade or hemodynamic compromise. They also got her a CT from the abdomen and pelvis, and it revealed no significant lymphadenopathy and no evidence of abscesses or other acute pathology. Uh, I don't know what to make of the. I feel like this is very important and probably uh, crucial to the uh, uh, case. Uh, I don't. Uh, I was I was hoping that the uh, ventric ventricular walls would be thickened. Um, and then I don't know, uh, what to make, uh, I've never heard of lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum. Um, I, I don't know of an inflammatory condition that causes that. The first thing that comes to mind, although it would be in, you know, why would a congenital or hereditary thing like that be presenting at 75? Um, there are some genoderms, um, that can have uh, um, like right ventricular, uh, you can get like right ventricular outflow tract tach tachycardia. It's um, uh, not Carvajal, but Naxo syndrome, but that, I don't think that's what this is. Um, no significant ly lymphadenopathy is an important finding. And I was thinking about lymphoma, um, the lactate, um, uh, with, uh, you know, sometimes that can be elevated in malignancies. Um, I think that there not being any um, significant lymphadenopathy makes that uh, less likely. Um, you could still have a leukemia or something presenting with leukemia acutis, but I think that, that the CT abdomen pelvis is reassuring um, from that aspect. So right now we have a, uh, a, an acute onset diffuse rash, um, that seems to be involving the heart and, uh, the kidneys. Um, and I'm, I wish I knew what to make of this lipomatous, uh, hypertrophy and maybe it's not important. Really amazing discussion so far. Um, I am anticipating that we'll likely get a, a skin biopsy in the, the next one to Aliquot. So kind of before we get there, I'm curious if 
now some of the differentials that you've mentioned, like the amyloid, lymphoma, others, what would you be looking for on the skin biopsy that would correlate with one of those? Yeah, so um, uh, amyloid, um, uh, I'm not, uh, you can have primary cutaneous amyloid. Um, I think that, uh, and then you can have uh, amyloid occurring in the context of like a systemic amyloid. I I think that the uh, normal uh, or, or the, the TTE lacking findings of cardiac amyloid in the lack of like really robust proteinuria uh, uh, kind of uh, are making me move um, amyloid down a little bit. Uh, that you would see sort of this um, collections of this like pink uh, homogenous material that's kind of, it looks kind of like cracked. Um, and uh, then you you do uh, certain stains with it. There's like thioflavin T, Congo red, um, uh, violet. There's like six different stains. Um, and then with the lymphoma, um, you would, that looks very different and you would basically see with a nodule, you would probably see a dense dermal infiltrate of, uh, lymphocytes. B cells, uh, a B cell lymphomas will typically have a Gren zone, which is this very thin area underneath the epidermis that is spared, um, in between the epidermis and the dermal infiltrate. And then T cell lymphomas, uh, often won't ha have that. And they'll often have like um, uh, epidermotropism where the lymphocytes invade the epidermis. Fascinating. Wow. I had not heard of that. Um, all right, Jimena, back to you. So we have other labs. Uh, we got the LDH that was 573. We got some uric acid that was 10. Point nine, um, and you mentioned in the past Alcoat that this person uh, needed some IV fluids, and they gave it to her, and the lactate decreased to three point four, though it never completely resolved. We also okay. have. Oh, do you want to discuss? No, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and we're gonna have the skin biopsy, which is what you wanted <laughs> a long time ago. Um, the skin biopsy reveal. Can I say before this, I I want to say that now now I, with these labs, that makes me more concerned for like increased cell turnover. Um, uh, so um, I was wrong. <laughs> the CT abdomen pelvis can still be uh, this. This makes uh, I'm hoping to hear about a dermal in, infiltrate of lymphocytes uh, as you're about to talk about the uh, biopsy. And. Uh, amazing. And before he kind of gives that to us, you had talked about a little bit about kind of the, you were concerned for lymphoma. You mentioned that 75% are T cell lymphoma. At this point, are you anticipate, anticipating a particular type or where is your mind at with that? Oh, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a very fair question. And I think that um, I, there's not a hard and fast rule for you to be able uh, to predict it. Um, uh, looking at the morphology of the skin, um, um, like if you just had that picture and it was just like a collection of papules, it would probably be more likely to be a B cell lymphoma, but it's described as being very diffuse. Again, base rate, it's probably, probably going to be a T cell lymphoma. Um, but I do feel like that sort of a violaceous color, um, tends to be more associated, um, with B cell lymphomas. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna, uh, to save face, I'm gonna, because I don't think you can, uh, uh, be super accurate most of the time. I'm not going to put my nickel down on which one. You definitely don't have to. <laughs> um, all right. Amazing. Jimena, back to you. I think we are all very curious what this biopsy shows. <laughs> I know <laughs> this biopsy showed Diffuse involvement by B lymphoid cells with PAX5 expression and a very high proliferative rate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, PAX5 expression is a, as a B cell marker. Um, typically, the most common one that you'll use is CD20. Um, sometimes B cells will lose uh, a CD20. Um, that can happen, um, when they take on more of like a plasma cytoid, 
uh, um, morphology. Um, the other scenario where that happens is like Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, a lot of times they will uh, lose CD20 and you'll have to use PAX5. They'll often be CD30 positive and CD15 negative. Um, and then a very high proliferative late, the, the most common thing that they'll use is this thing called key 67. Um, uh, sometimes that's really high in things like Burkitt lymphoma, um, which typically is more common in like younger people. Um, and in this context may just be telling us that, um, these are malignant cells that are, um, turning over quickly. And I'm curious, now that we kind of have this biopsy showing kind of the diffuse involvement of B cells, is there, does this kind of make the diagnosis or do you do need to do any further work up to classify it in some way? Yeah, so you do, uh, typically you do. So if you, so B cell lymphoma um, is a good starting point, then you'll typically uh, um, do stains um, that correlate to different parts of the um, lymphoid follicle. Um, to, to make inferences about its origin. Um, so for instance, BCL2 uh, stains T cells and cells of the marginal zone. So that'll be positive in marginal zone lymphoma and then also uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and um, systemic uh, um, follicular, follicular lymphoma. Um, you can also use BCL6 and CD10 those are uh, less likely to be positive in things like diffuse large cell uh, uh, B cell lymphoma, more likely to be positive in things like um, uh, primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma. Um, uh, other thing, there are other stains you can do um, like cyclin D1 um, for mantle cell lymphoma. Um, so can I make a lot of progress uh, based on a 75-year-old uh, female with an acute onset B cell lymphoma? Um, I, don't, I don't know the demographics off the top of my head. Um, because she's this sick, um, things like um, marginal zone lymphoma, uh, it tends to be pretty indolent. Um, follicular lymphoma also is less likely to be aggressive and will often present with like lymphadenopathy. So I'm wondering um, if this could be uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, and then there are a variety of uh, much uh, like more rare B cell lymphomas that you, you need to do some extra stains to kind of gain clarity about. All right, thank you. Uh, Jimena, what happened in the rest of this case? So we're ready for the final diagnosis, and the patient was diagnosed with primary cutaneous large B cell lymphoma, specifically the lick type, because they did a lot of images, uh, and none of them revealed nodal involvement. And she went currently to get chemotherapy with RCHOP, RTOP. Yeah. Okay. So uh, primary cutaneous large B cell lymphoma is sort of um, synonymous with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. They call it leg type because 85% of the time it occurs on the lower extremity, but that's not, you don't want to be fooled by that. And in, in this case, um, uh, um, uh, hers, it sounds like started on the arm. Um, uh, so it's leg type, but it started on the arm. Um, and um, this, as opposed to primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma and uh, marginal zone lymphoma, behaves more like a um, aggressive systemic lymphoma, and they often need uh, chemotherapy for it, as she got. So what a great case. Thank you guys for uh, letting me participate. No, thank you so much. You were kind of like spot on suspecting lymphoma very, very early on and kind of your your differential all the way from the beginning and kind of how the skin findings and biopsy integrated into that was really um, amazing. And I, I learned so much um, from the session. So really, thank you. Um, Jimena, I just wanted to check to see uh, any other information you have about the case or that's kind of everything. Well, the the only extra information that I have um, was that, well, I already told you guys about the treatment and regarding to her cardiac findings, it turned out that she had previous studies where 
uh, these lipomatose hypertrophy was noted. So it was more attributed to just being that than any lymphoma involvement. And um, yeah, that that's pretty much it. Nice. Yeah, the the violaceous uh, nodule is a uh, a classic buzzword for uh, lymphoma. So if you guys see something that looks violaceous uh, and it feels firm when you touch it, you want to think about a lymphoma. Thank you. And um, now that we're at the end of the session, uh, Amy, I'm curious if you could kind of reflect back, like what are three you know, key points you want um, whoever listens to this to take away? Um, yeah, I think, um, what do I want people to take away? Um, the main thing that I want uh, people to take, I think the important thing to take away is sort of what I just said, where if you see um, uh, something of this color um, and that is firm, and firmness suggests like a depth and an infiltrative aspect, um, you wanna be uh, suspecting a lymphoma. The location, the number, uh, and the uh, uh, like pattern to it are a little bit less important when it comes to lymphoma. So the, the central clearing, which may be helpful at other times is not, doesn't really change things here. So the color uh, and the um, firmness um, and then that sort of gets you onto the lymphoma track. And then the next thing was sort of the sick and not sick. Um, and, you know, her vitals was sort of the first clue that maybe she's not doing well. And then from there, we got some important derangements, the elevated lactate, which was maybe a little bit of um, uh, volume depletion, a little bit of type B lactic acidosis. Um, uh, the kidneys, which um, I guess we, we're not quite sure uh, ultimately what the etiology was there, if it was related or not. And then certainly the LDH and the uric acid, which are classic for like a, um, a, a tumor lysis type situation. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, really just want to uh, shout out Jimena for presenting this case in such a clear way. And um and Eamon, again, thank you for kind of the clarity of your teaching and being so kind of honest about what parts kind of what parts you did know, what parts were challenging and um, just really appreciate you like so authentically and brilliantly walking through this case. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank and, you, guys. Yeah, we will end the session here. Have a great rest of your days, everyone. Sure. Bye.